Hi guys, my name is Kyle Ritter. I'm with the Cavern program, and this summer I've been placed in Dr. Cooper's lab. This is about my 10th week working with him, and today I'm going to be giving you all a presentation on fluoxetine, which is Prozac, and the acute effects that it can have on Drosophila and crayfish central nervous systems. All right, so I'm going to give a brief outline of my presentation today. First, we'll start, start with the introduction, where I go over what fluoxetine is, uh, the side effects they can have, and some brief important facts about it. Also, we'll be discussing the serotonergic system in a little bit more depth. Then I'm going to have kind of a hodgepodge methods and results section where I go over the experience that we did, what results we gleaned from them, and what we can uh, kind of extrapolate from those results. Uh, then uh, a quick discussion at the end where I summarize all of our major findings in the study and what we can take from them as well. So first, the research goal of this project was to determine the mechanisms and the acute effects of high doses of fluoxetine on the central nervous system of crayfish and drosophila. And then we can look at what we found and by extension extrapolate these findings into humans. Uh, then a uh, quick discussion at the end where I summarize all of our major findings in the study and what we can take from them as well. So first, the research goal of this project was to determine the mechanisms and the acute effects of high doses of fluoxetine on the central nervous system of crayfish and drosophila. And then we can look at what we found and, by extension, extrapolate these findings into humans. All right, so how did this project develop? Well, one of Dr. Cooper's grad students, Zana Majid, was looking at um, the serotonergic system and using neuromodulators on that system to try and change the behavior and sensory output of Drosophila. So what he found was that there was an odd reaction with an exogenous application of Prozac to the Drosophila central nervous system, specifically the NMJs, or neuromuscular junction sites. This is weird because normally, um, when ingested, uh, um, Prozac takes several weeks, two to three-ish, for uh, humans to see the therapeutic effects of the drug. So in this case, why would there be a very quick effect with this high dose when it's applied directly to this um, neuromuscular junction? All right, so a little bit more information about the 5-HT system. This is the 5-hydroxytryptamine system, which is otherwise known as the serotonin system. Up in the right-hand corner of the screen, you can see the structural formula of serotonin. And so this is a very important system. Uh, it's, serotonin itself is a neuro, neurotransmitter, um, one of the earliest likely to be um, to have been used in most animals. Uh, this has been demonstrated in some primitive um, organisms, such as nematodes and sea slugs. Serotonin is a potent modulator in humans, affecting many different aspects of life, uh, including mood, depression, cognitive abilities, health, development, so on and so forth like that. Um, and where fluoxetine fits into the system is that fluoxetine acts as an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which blocks the reuptake of serotonin in the CNS synapses. Um, and this is thought to be the primary mechanism of fluoxetine. There's a good diagram on the right-hand side of the screen showing the vesicles and showing vesicle fusion, releasing serotonin across the pre- to postsynaptic nerve endings. This would normally be repackaged, but with the addition of fluoxetine, this blocks the repackaging of vesicles. And the ideal way that it works is that it leaves more serotonin in the system, making people happier. All right, and now for some more information about fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is also known as Prozac. Uh, it is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, I said that earlier. It's one of the most common antidepressants uh, prescribed uh, today. It is, was number three, I believe, in 2010, and it currently is the most common, commonly, commonly prescribed antidepressant in children. It's also prescribed to some pets uh, for various reasons as well, uh, hence the happy dog that we see on the right-hand side of the screen. As previously demonstrated in Zan Majid's study, there is the possibility of an alternate pharmacological mechanism, or secondary pharmacological mechanism, that we that is currently not known about. Um, this is also bolstered by the fact that other SSRIs take less time to see effects, such as LSD, obviously. Um, another medical application of this study could potentially be uh, fluoxetine overdoses, which are a moderately common form of overdose. And currently, there are no effective treatments for these. Here, the doctors are able to treat the symptoms, but not the actual mechanism of effect. I've highlighted a couple of points in this case study from 2000, from the year 2000, that really kind of hit home the last point that I made in the, last, in the previous slide. Uh, fluoxetine overdoses. Um, this case study details the death of a child with a cytochrome P450 2D6 genetic deficiency. And some interesting points to take home from this are that the indicated death was caused by fluoxetine toxicity, and this child had a defect at the cytochrome P450 CYP2D locus. 
which is kind of a mouthful. Um, anyways, this results in poor metabolism of fluoxetine. So over time, this child was prescribed with several drugs. The um, main one was fluoxetine. Uh, with this genetic deficiency, he had a buildup of fluoxetine, and after several months, he passed away from it. And so this study aims, well, some of the possible side effects of this study could be um, remediation of issues like this and overdoses like this. All right, so I'm going to go over some preliminary testing that we did before getting into the actual um, methods of this study. So first of all, to get some baseline readings of kind of what Prozac will do to Drosophila and crayfish uh, behavior and neuromuscular junctions, we did Drosophila death counts and we looked at uh, crayfish injections. So first, with the, with the Drosophila death counts, we fed um, 5 to 10 larvae feedings of various phylloxidine concentrations for about 24 hours. Um, in this case, we're using late second and early third instars, which I'm highlighting with the mouse right here. The reason for this is that at this point in their life cycle, they're eating a lot, but they're not old enough to pupate within the 24-hour period that we're studying them for. Uh, the interesting results that we found in this were, was that there was mortality out of one molar solution of fluoxetine, but not in the other concentrations. With the crayfish injections, we took crayfish of relatively similar size, but we were doing this uh, in a dosage-based solution, so it's kind of standard throughout all of them. Uh, what we did was we injected these solutions of various fluoxetine concentrations into the crayfish and measured the range of results that we got. Um, what we saw was kind of variation of... Uh, some form of lethargy in most of them, but we also saw some death and paralysis in the crayfish as well. And what we did with this was that we used a behavioral index ranging from 0 to 4, 0 being dead and 4 being normal, to kind of subjectively measure these results so that we could do statistical testing on them at some point in the future. And here's a video demonstrating what I've just been talking about. So this, as you can see, is a normal crayfish. It's flipped on its back, but it's still fairly lively, uh, moving around. Its legs are moving, and it's trying to grab and pinch, pinch the um, the wooden dowel that John or I myself are playing, poking at it with. On the right-hand side, we see a very lethargic, borderline paralyzed crayfish. If you look closely, you can see its legs are trying to move. It grabs onto the dowel for a second here, but it does not have the ability to completely right itself um, in a second here. We're going to start tapping on its tail, which should in elicit a tail flip, but it doesn't. And so this is just a kind of good example of what we're talking about when we say a one or a two in this case. All right, so here's a graph kind of depicting in a better fashion what I was just talking about. Um, on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see the behavioral index uh, ranging from zero to four. And at the bottom is the time post-injection ranging from initial, which would be zero, to 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45, one hour, around 30, two hours, and then 24 hour time periods, um, at which point we measured the um, activity of each crayfish. Um, so each individual line represents a different crayfish, um, with the exception of the black line at the top. Technically, it, it is five crayfish at the top, but they're all overlapped because they're normal. Those constitute the sham injections that we did, which was just saline. The other injections were at various concentrations, excuse me, not various concentrations, but were at two millimolar concentration, and so just as an example, if you follow this red line, it started off normal uh, after 15 minutes, it was excessively lethargic, then moved to paralyzed for about 40 or 30 minutes, then it went back to lethargic, and then was normal after 24 hours. And so you just follow each of those like that. On to the actual methods of this presentation, or this study, I should say. Um, to investigate the mechanism of acute effect on neural, neuronal function, we use several different preps. First of all, the fly neuromuscular junction. We also use crayfish neuromuscular junction and axon preps. And in these uh, neuromuscular, junction, neuromuscular junctions and axon preps, we observe minis, EPSPs, and action potentials, which I'll detail right now. Minis are a single vesicular fusion event. EPSPs are excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Um, and action potentials are an electrical signal that is simulated down the motor neuron of a cell. Um, after this, we added cadmium to block the calcium pumps that we'll go into later. We also did some intracellular ER testing and above the reticulum testing, um, and then we also looked at heart rates at the very end. So first, the first prep that we did was the Drosophila prep, um, the, excuse me, the Drosophila neuromuscular junction preparation. 
Um, the picture on the left shows it in its full, the completed form. On the right here, we have it under black light showing the central nervous system. This has a GFP gene in it and it highlights the brain right here, this little figure right there, and all the neural circuitry of the fly itself. And so to do this prep, you have to first make a incision in the dorsal side of the uh, larva um, after you pin it between mouth hooks and spiracles. This is so as not to damage the brain or any of the central nervous system. Um, after that incision, you make a lateral incision, uh, also on the dorsal side, and then you pin it open, uh, remove all the insides, and then you have basically a flayed Drosophila um, wall prep. All right, so here we have another diagram of the, Dros of the Drosophila neuromuscular junction preparation. This is kind of a simplified diagram of it, uh, showing the brain, muscles, and the posterior nerves. And what we can do with this is we can suck up some of the posterior nerves in the stimulating electrode, send electrical current down it, and evoke EPSPs and some minis as well. So the only issue with the, with the Drosophila and MJ prep is that we cannot get into the axons because it's too small. Um, with this, we use the crayfish MJ prep or crayfish axon prep. To do this, we first autonomize one of its um, front legs, um, removing the closer muscle. With this, we can simulate the opener muscle, um, thus evoking EPSPs, action potentials, and minis as well. Here's a physiological model of what I've just been talking about. You see the crayfish axon right here, and an action potential that's, that has been generated from it. With this, we can simulate the axon, sending an action potential down this motor neuron here. Through this, we open and close calcium, excuse me, we can open and close voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, so moving this down. Once it reaches the head, it will open up the voltage-gated calcium channels, releasing vessel, excuse me, stimulating vessel fusion onto the postsynaptic nerve ending. Um, from this, we can record EPSPs and minis, and then from here, we can record action potentials. Right, so this is a graph showing the larval drosophila nerve muscle junction minis. Um, this is complete, this is without simulating the motor nerve at all. So what we see right here is just um, completely random, spontaneous, uh, vesicle fusion in the synapse here. So what we can see is that in the saline prep there is a single vesicle fusion event right here, maybe another one right there. Um, the image is not much compared to the Prozac, which is shows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, dish. Um, this is weird. You would not expect to see this because Prozac is thought to work on serotonin serotonergic um, systems and the system that we're looking at right now is a glutaminergic glutaminergic system. So what is happening? Um, as I said, we see increased minis, or single vessel fusions, in both the crayfish and Drosophila CNS, or NMJs. This, can, this gives us uh, three possible explanations. First of all, uh, the Prozac could be somehow opening calcium channels. There could be some form of calcium leakage inside the cell. And third, there could be some internal release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. How to test these now? Uh, we first can block the voltage-gated calcium channels on the motor neuron and the nerve terminals, um, which will allow us to see whether the um, calcium intake is coming from external or internal source. We can also isolate these cells, uh, stimulate them with Prozac, and measure with a calcium indicator to further back this up and also to determine what place inside the endoplasmic reticulum calcium could be coming from. So first, we show um, the effect that Prozac has on action potentials. So as I said, we can we see a decrease, we see a significant decrease in the action potential um, when Prozac is added to crayfish axons. Um, this indicates that the Prozac is likely blocking sodium channels, um, preventing the release of calcium channels further along the nerve terminal. And here's another graph depicting what I've just gone over. Um, you can see here, the action potential starts off fairly high, around 24 millivolts, um, but and that's at a concentration of 10 micromolar Prozac solution. However, once we switch to the 100 micromolar solution, uh, a factor of 10 increase, uh, we see a significant drop off. Even down here, the electrode popped out, possibly due to the maze in the muscle as well. So we see a shift from about 24 to 2 ish millivolts, which is a pretty significant change in the axon excitatory phase crayfish opener muscle. 
So now what effect does Prozac have on the EPSPs? Um, similar to the action potential, the decrease, or excuse me, the blockage of the sodium channels likely decreases the action the EPSPs that we see in the muscle as well. This is further demonstrated in these two figures that I have, the first one here, the second one I'll show you in a second. Um, as you can see here, there's about 10 stimuli in the saline solution resulting in this EPSP and some minis down here. But then once we switch to a Prozac solution, it completely shuts the nerve terminal down. Um, the minis that you can see here and here demonstrate that there's still some calcium coming in, so it's not really shutting off the calcium channels, um, and there's still calcium coming from an internal source in the cell. This is also demonstrated in the crayfish EPSPs, where we can see EPSPs right here, um, some maze down here, and the, here are the stimulus artifacts. Once again, the Prozac completely shuts the nerve terminal down, um, adding more support to the hypothesis that Prozac could be blocking sodium channels, and also to the idea that um, the calcium source is coming from inside the cell rather than an external source. All right. Lastly, what effect does Prozac have on the minis? Uh, we've demonstrated that Prozac blocks sodium channels and we are blocking the calcium channels with cadmium, but we still see a significant increase in mini in minis from the saline to the Prozac solution here. This further indicates that there is some source of another source of calcium coming from inside the cell that we are going to test further in a second. This is a graph further depicting what I've just talked about. Uh, you can see the saline run up here. It shows some minis with the addition of cadmium that it decreases significantly, but then this increases increases again with the addition of Prozac. So this indicates that A, Prozac is not opening calcium channels, and B, there is another source of cal calcium coming from inside the cell. This is the last diagram of this. Um, we have spontaneous events on the left, number of those which are minis. Then we have the minutes that we looked at these preps for. Um, these four points are in the saline, which shows about average of 200-ish, probably, um, single vesicle fusion events. And then the four in the middle show with cadmium, there's a pretty significant decrease, and then a pretty significant increase with the cadmium plus Prozac solution. Uh, this might not be 100% accurate, but because it's hard to measure all the vesicle fusion events, there could be multiple vesicle fusion events in this case, and there's a lot of them. As you can see, there's 800 up here. But it's just a good diagram showing you that there's a significant dif difference between the cadmium and the cadmium Prozac solutions. So what is happening? At this point in time, we have two essential hypotheses, both kind of circulating around the endoplasmic reticulum. We have already blocked these calcium channels down here, but we're still seeing vesicle fusion, um, meaning there is some form of calcium still inside the cell. So where could that be coming from? The main idea is that it's coming from the endoplasmic reticulum. And there's two possible methods that could be, um, that, excuse me, there's two possible mechanisms that Prozac could be affecting this by. First of all, it could be blocking this circuit pump here, which is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, this pump removes Prozac from the inside of the cell into the, excuse me, this is a reuptake pump of calcium from inside the cell into the endoplasmic reticulum. Over time, this ranadine receptor right here um, leaks out calcium, and this will take it back into this, the endoplasmic reticulum. The other idea is that the Prozac could be, um, excuse me, so the idea with this is that Prozac will block this, which will cause a buildup of calcium on the outside and cause vesicle fusion. The other idea is that Prozac could somehow be um, enhancing this ranadine pump and or opening it and allowing for more calcium to leak out of it at any given time. This would also inc result in an increase in calcium concentration outside of the endoplasmic reticulum, resulting in vesicle fusion. So, to test this, we contacted Dr. Eugene Boulier at Temple University in Pennsylvania. Um, what he, he works on mice central nervous systems and their isolated neurons from the ambiguous and acumbens portions of the brain. Um, what he did to help us out was he placed these cells in a bath completely devoid of calcium, then stimulated this with Prozac and measured with a calcium indicator. This was initially uh, to test whether it was coming from internally or externally, which backed up our idea that it was coming from an internal source. He then used a thapsogargon. He, he then used thapsogargon, which is a blocker of circa, 
um, allowed the cell to release all of its calcium, um, meaning there's no calcium left in the endoplasmic reticulum. From here, he placed Prozac on the endoplasmic reticulum. Oops, didn't need to do that. He placed Prozac on the endoplasmic reticulum and measured it again and still saw an increase, ideally, and still saw an increase in the uh, calcium concentration. This indicates that it is like that Prozac is likely stimulating the ranadine receptor rather than blocking the circular receptor. All right. So at this point in our study, we wanted to, to figure out what effect Prozac could possibly have on other types of tissue. Uh, one of the other tissues that we're working with primarily in the Cooper lab is heart tissue or myocardium. Um, so we decided to add this to some of the heart preps that we've done. Um, and we found that concentrations of above 10 micromolar stop the heart completely in relaxation, which is kind of odd because you'd think that from these myosin thick filaments, it would stop it in a contracted position. Um, at lower concentrations, we show no clear effect. And the hypothesis mechanism for this is that Prozac could also be blocking the calcium channels um, because there are no voltage gated sodium channels in the Drosophila heart. So this is another graph defecting what I've just talked about. These show a change from initial to the Prozac solution. So this should be in the initial, then Prozac, initial, Prozac, initial, Prozac, initial, Prozac. Um, the bottom here shows a percent change. So as you can see in the 110 micromolar solutions, there was a 100% change in all of them. They just shut down completely. In the one micromolar solution, the effect is less pronounced. We still see some stoppage of the heart. Um, however, it's hard to discern whether that's significant or not because of the error bar here. Um, and then in the 100 nanomolar, it's, there's no clear, no clear trend. So the discussion that we have here, um, at high levels of Prozac, uh, 100 micromolars or greater, uh, we can block action potential in crayfish axons, increase spontaneous synaptic vesicle fusion, or minis, at, in the NMJs, and completely shut down the EPSPs of crayfish and drosophila. We have also shown that it's possible to paralyze crayfish for a short time, and so their activity at two millimolar solutions, injections, I should say. There's also been fatality in Drosophila feedings, and we are also we've also shown that Prozac is able to stop Drosophila hearts at concentrations greater than 10 micromolars, and that there's less of a, less of an effect at concentrations lower than that. So some future directions that we can take this study in, we look at the P450 2D6 gene that. I briefly, briefly went over in the case study prior, prior to this, um, or we could find a similar gene in Drosophila that shows a deficiency in processing excess phylloxetine, see what effect the addition of phylloxetine would have to those flies. We also use a heat-sensitive circuit knockdown line. This would be another approach sort of to looking at the um, endoplasmic reticulum and whether it was the circa pump or the granadine receptor which of those was um, either blocking or dumping out calcium. This would be a more genetic approach to it and give us more data to back that up with. We could also look at crayfish heart rates um, in, in addition to the Drusov heart rates. Also, we have a publication process, progress. Uh, it's it is how the acute actions of fluoxetine and Prozac on neuronal and cardiac function. Here's my acknowledgments, references. So thank you guys for listening to my presentation.